the Ultimatum Precision Deadline Build, this week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this Monday we are going to answer some questions about rifle builds, and then we are going to talk about what we have planned for the Ultimatum Deadline Action Build. Now, real quick, before we get into this, I'm going to talk about the Ultimatum Deadline Action. Now, the Deadline Action is a brand new action from Ultimatum Precision. Uh, this is a Remington footprint sort of. Uh, so it's very similar to the footprint of a Remington 700. There are many Remington 700 chassis out there currently uh, that this action will fit in. It is a short action chassis. So anything that a 308 Remington 700 would drop in, uh, this will come close. There are a couple of differences to the footprint real quick that we'll talk about. One is that it does have an integral recoil lug uh, built into the front of the action. So you don't have to worry about the regular ring recoil lugs that the barrel holds in. Uh, secondly, the the trigger hanger back here, uh, there can sometimes be interference points with the back of the trigger hanger and the inlet in the chassis. So you may have to relieve that just a little bit if it's not specifically designed for the ultimatum deadline. There are also some differences in the rear tang, uh, but most of the chassis that we've dropped this into and look at uh, don't seem to be affected by those small differences. Uh, but overall, it's designed to be a Remington 700 action replacement. It does take Remington 700 triggers. This hanger drops out and you have two small slave pins that hold the uh, trigger in place and then it bolts back in. So really easy, really nice. The big deal is this is a three lug action uh, with a very, very short bolt lift and a very smooth bolt throw. Uh, it is a full custom action. It's got a, really, a lot of really nice features like bolt fluting already in it. Uh, so it should help uh, prevent the action from binding up with grit and grime, mud, sleet, ice, all that fun stuff. It also is replaceable bolt heads. Uh, so if you wanted to be able to set up a system where you could put a um, competition caliber barrel on it, like a six Creed or a 243 or six Dasher or something of that nature, but still be able to train with a lower caliber, say a 223. Typically, that's difficult because they utilize two different bolt faces. Uh, with the Ultimatum Deadline, you can purchase both those bolt faces, and then you can swap the bolt faces over fairly quickly uh, when you swap the barrels over. So if that's something that you're looking at, that is an option here. Uh, they do come in uh, three different bolt face diameters, and we'll leave a link down below to Ultimatum Precision's website where you can go check that out. Uh, now, the Ultimatum Precision Deadline Action really excited us because it is that Remington 700 footprint, but also because the Deadline Action, as opposed to the original U300 Action, the Deadline is threaded for Savage Prefit barrels. Uh, so you can take the same type of barrel that you would purchase uh, for a Savage Model 10 and thread it into the ultimatum deadline and then lock it down with a barrel nut, either whatever Savage barrel nut you choose or Ultimatum Precision's own barrel nut. I obviously would recommend Ultimatum Precision's barrel nut because it looks very nice and complements the action itself. Uh, but that makes it very simple to be able to swap barrels at home and that was the big deal that attracted us uh, to the Ultimatum Precision action. Now we're going to go through the components that I intend to use on this build uh, here shortly towards the end of the episode, but we're going to answer some questions real quick because I did ask you guys what questions you have about a rifle build project like this. And our first question comes from Chris, and Chris asks, what are the pros and cons of Remage barrels on Remington 700 actions? Uh, well, the pros are a big one. Uh, the pros are that you get the same ability with a Remington 700 action that you do with a Savage Model 10, and that is you can replace your barrel at home. Uh, so if you have a competition caliber again that maybe has a short barrel life, instead of getting to the end of that barrel life and having to ship your action off to a gunsmith to have it rebarreled, uh, you can actually rebarrel your action at home with a remage barrel. Uh, now the difference there is when you ship a, 
a action off to a gunsmith to have it rebarreled. What he's going to do is he's going to take a barrel blank uh, off the shelf. He is going to turn the chamber end of that barrel blank to a specific thread pattern. He's going to put a shoulder on it, and then he's going to cut the breech face uh, to match the breech face that you need for the bolt on that specific action. Uh, then he is going to thread the action and the recoil lug on, uh, and he is going to take a measurement. I'm sorry, first he's going to rough cut the chamber. Uh, so he's going to rough cut the chamber with a reamer, then he's going to thread the action on, take a measurement, and decide how deep he needs to go with that reamer. He's going to run a reamer in, usually a finishing reamer, and cut that chamber to depth. Well, he has to cut the chamber, put the action on, check the headspace with a go or no go gauge, uh, back everything back off, do any finishing cuts he needs to do. So it really requires a lathe to rebarrel a Remington 700 in the traditional manner, the same way that the factory does it. With a remage barrel, you throw all that stuff out. Uh, the factory, when they manufacture the barrel, they will cut the chamber end they will cut the uh, threaded tenon that is going to go into your action. They will chamber the barrel, cut the breech face, and all this is cut to a specific print for the Savage Actions. Now, when you install that barrel on your Savage Action at home, you're going to clamp the barrel into a barrel vise. You're going to slide on your recoil. I'm sorry, you're going to thread on your barrel nut. You're going to slide on your recoil lug. You're going to thread your action in, and you're going to thread it down pretty far, and then you're going to install a go gauge. And you're basically going to close the action on that go gauge and then finish threading the action on until the barrel stops. Now, what you've done is you've pinched the go gauge between the shoulder and the chamber, and and the breech face on the bolt, or the bolt face, and that sets your headspace. Now you're going to turn your barrel nut down, you're going to lock that down, pinching the recoil lug between the action and the barrel nut, and then you're going to take your torque wrench out, and you're going to torque down that nut. And now, when you eject your headspace gauge, uh, you should be able to take that go gauge out, put a no-go gauge in, the action should not close on the go gauge, and you're done. Uh, you now have a headspace barrel that you've installed at home with a uh, barrel vise or a uh, bench-mounted barrel block and a torque wrench, and that is about it. Uh, it makes it very simple. So the Remage barrel systems take all those advantages from the Model 10 and it duplicates that system on a Remington barrel. Now unfortunately you can't just take a Savage Prefit and screw it onto a Remington because the breech face is different and the thread pattern is different. Uh, so it does require a barrel that is specifically cut for a Remington receiver, but now you'll have a barrel nut instead of a shoulder that sets the headspace. Uh, so that is the big advantage. It just switches everything over. It prevents you from having to pay gunsmith fees. Um, you end up getting a barrel ready to go for a lot less cost uh, than buying a blank and having a gunsmith install it on a Remington. Now let's switch over to the cons. Uh, the biggest con is user error. Uh, if you incorrectly install the barrel, you can have problems. Let's say you decide that uh, go and no-go gauges are too expensive and you just want a headspace on a live round, which is a bad, bad deal to begin with. Do not do that. Uh, but if somebody decides to headspace on a live round, you don't know where that live round is in the headspace uh, area. It may be long, it may be short. Uh, let's say you have a cartridge that's a little bit long, you go to headspace it, or you realize you're not actually headspacing on the shoulder of the cartridge, you're headspacing on the bullet hitting the lands, and it was a long bullet. Well, now when you go to chamber that cartridge and fire it, you may have excessive headspace, you may have uh, head separation, you may have all kinds of other issues. Or conversely, you may set it up with a cartridge that the headspace is too short, uh, now factory ammunition won't chamber, and again, you have all kinds of problems. So that's one con. Uh, do it correctly, buy the correct tools, buy the correct gauges. Uh, the other con is you may run into tolerance stacking. You may run into a situation where everything just lines up perfectly and this pre-fit drop-in barrel may not fit correctly. And then you may either have to return to the factory or may have to turn to a gunsmith to have them fix it. But those are very small cons. If you do it correctly, uh, then there is the possibility that you're going to turn out a very, very accurate system. And there are a lot of guys out there that have had great accuracy uh, with the Remage Barrel systems. Uh, so that's the basic pros and cons with the Remage Barrel. Our next question comes from Houston. Houston asks, thanks for all you do. I really enjoy MCM. I would like to see what brass you're going to use. I know 
Lapua is the gold standard, but I've been hearing great things about Alpha and Peterson. Have you tried any of the other premium brass makers? It might be neat to try some for this project. Uh, well, Houston, thanks for watching. And uh, first of all, as you notice there, I kind of glitched a little bit uh, on that big L word. And the reason is because uh, a lot of you guys have written in and told me I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. Uh, we do have a lot of European viewers. We have some Scandinavian viewers, uh, some up in that area that actually know the correct pronunciation of the word. And down here in the US, especially in the Midwest, we tend to pronounce it Lapua. Um, apparently that's incorrect and it's Lapua. It's not, there's no accent on the end. Uh, so I'm trying to switch over and I'm trying to pronounce Lapua the correct way. Uh, so if you guys catch me doing it wrong, please hold me accountable. Leave a message in the comments down below. Uh, but that apparently is the correct way to pronounce it. Uh, now again, if I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, I tried to watch some videos on YouTube from uh, Lapua reps and find out uh, what the correct way to say it is. It's going to be difficult for me to correct that because it's so ingrained. I've got uh, those repetitions of saying it the wrong way, so correcting it will take a while. Uh, as far as your question though, Houston, uh, we do have some Lapua in right now. Uh, I've got 200 rounds that I was going to use for the uh, 6.5 Ma 10 project. Um, that will probably still go ahead. We've got a lot of Hornady brass here left over and I probably will not have issues with the Hornady brass uh, in the bolt gun. Um, again, we're there's a different dynamic when a gas gun is firing and extracting that cartridge and throwing it out uh, versus what you're getting with a bolt gun. So we may not have the same problems. Uh, we also have some federal ammunition here, some federal 6.5 Creedmoor. Uh, so when we get done shooting that, we'll have federal brass to play with. Uh, but I'm really interested in the stuff uh, that Alpha is putting out. Uh, I believe Starline is releasing some 6.5 Creedmoor. I haven't looked into Peterson a whole lot, uh, but there are a bunch of companies out there that are releasing 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, large rifle and small rifle primer brass. So I'm really interested in trying some different brass and seeing what kind of extreme spread and standard deviation we can get with different ones. So we may do that going forward. Uh, the issue is brass testing is kind of a laborious process uh, because you're going to have to work up some kind of accuracy charge or uh, accuracy load for each piece of brass before you can really get into that good standard deviation and the uh, extreme spread checking. So uh, we'll see how that goes. I, I don't hold to just weighing brass to check for consistency uh, because it's really case capacity that is giving us our consistency, uh, not the actual weight of the brass. Uh, so it actually requires working up a load and then shooting it off a chronograph. But we may look into some different brass manufacturers. I don't have any feelers out right now, uh, but we'll see as we go forward in the year. Our next question comes from Cedric, and Cedric asks, Hi John, what are your thoughts about the different contour match grade barrels with and without flutes? What do you think about Lothar Walther stainless steel barrels versus others? Thank you very much. Well, Cedric, um, first of all, on the flutes on heavy barrels, I generally don't go with fluted barrels. And the big reason is uh, fluting adds cost to the barrel and barrels are disposable. Uh, we're going to throw them away when we're done with them. So anything that's going to add cost to it that doesn't actually add a marked performance difference uh, is not something I'm going to be interested in. Uh, now, the barrel that we have here for this project is from Excalibur. Uh, it's a 24 inch 6.5 Creedmoor 1 and 8 twist and it is a Savage Pre fit, like we said. Um, and this barrel is a little bit heavier than a Varmint or a Sendero barrel. It's more of a Savage profile, uh, so it, it's a little bit thicker than what we normally run, but not overly so. Uh, it's very close to that Remington Sendero profile. And that is my preference because I think it gives me a good balance between weight and accuracy, especially in the 6mm and 6.5mm uh, bores. Uh, but Really, the main purpose for fluting is if I wanted to go with a big Mongo barrel and save weight um, and get increased rigidity over the same weight in a normal taper barrel. So that's the big thing and what a lot of people forget about fluting is uh, we're not comparing diameters anymore. We're comparing weights. A fluted barrel of the same weight 
as a non-fluted barrel uh, will be more rigid. Uh, but again, we're not working with weight limits in uh, PRS or NRL or any of that stuff. We are working uh, just with what we like, the balance of the gun, how well it moves from barricade to barricade. Uh, so in my opinion, it's not really that big of a deal. If you want to go lighter, go with a narrower diameter. Uh, there's no need to go with a straight taper or a uh, you know, heavy contour barrel or a full bull barrel. God help us if uh, you decide to go try to run a, a barricade with a 26 inch or 24 inch full bull. Uh, that's probably going to be a little bit of weight. Uh, but if I really want to go super lightweight, I'm going to look at something uh, like a proof research carbon wrap barrel or some of the other carbon wrapped barrels out there. If I really, really want to cut that down and make it lightweight for a younger shooter or a lighter bodied shooter. Uh, but my preference is not to go with the fluting. Um, I don't buy into a whole lot of that whole uh, cooling thing and all that stuff. Uh, just a larger mass of barrel uh, will assist you with heat buildup versus cutting flutes in it. And I'm also still hesitant about um, changes to the dimensions inside the barrel when you cut that much meat off the outside of the barrel. I know this seems to be something that is more prevalent in uh, hammer forged or button rifled barrels. I think we've gotten a whole lot better in our tooling, in our materials design now, so I think it's less of an issue now. Uh, but I still don't really want to cut meat out of a barrel when I don't need to. So just go with a smaller diameter. Now, reference your question about Lothar Walther barrels. Um, I don't have any experiences with them that are sticking out in my mind. I think at one point in time I may have had an AR that had a Lothar Walther match barrel on it. Uh, but... I don't have any bolt guns that we built up uh, with one of those barrels. There are so many high quality barrels out there that it is really a task to get through and try different barrels. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that we are going with the Excalibur barrel on this build is because I don't have any experience with it. Uh, a lot of guys have asked about them. Uh, so we're going to give it a try and see how it works out. But what I say is if you get a good deal on it, go ahead and buy it roll with it. Uh, again, barrels are like tires on cars. You're going to wear them out and then you're going to throw them away. So at least take it out and shoot it. If it shoots, great. Maybe you want to replace it with another one later on. Uh, if it doesn't shoot, scrap it. Use a different barrel next time. Uh, so that's my opinion on barrel selection at this point. There are just a ton of them out there. And unless you hear about one that you really specifically want to stay away from, and at this point, I really haven't heard of any premium barrels that are just absolute tomato steaks. Uh, most of them will shoot fairly well. Uh, and for PRS or NRL, when we're not talking about bench rest shooting, uh, they will really fill the bill for just about anything we need. So that's my recommendation on fluting and uh, trying out Lothar Walther barrels. And our next question comes from Steven. And Steven asks, what's the torque spec for the barrel nut? Uh, and Steven, that's going to differ depending upon the action and the barrel nut manufacturers. Savages, uh, when you're replacing the barrel, tend to be in that 30 to 40. Uh, my understanding from a quick check on the web is that uh, factory specs for the Savage barrel nut is about 70 foot-pounds. Uh, but most guys are using 30 to 40 foot-pounds when they replace the barrel. And that's a little bit easier on barrel nuts. A little bit easier on tooling. You don't have to worry about stripping tooling or uh, marring the outside of your barrel nut that's going to look all nasty. Uh, and it should hold that barrel in just fine. 30 to 40 foot pounds uh, is a lot of torque on uh, the kinds of fasteners that we're using. Uh, now, when we look at stuff like Remington barrels, when they're installed, they're just screwed in and they're just using the barrel as the fastener uh, to hold the recoil lug in and to hold that barrel in the action. Uh, they tend to be put in with uh, quite a bit of uh, torque. Uh, usually you end up having to whack it with a hammer or put a cheater bar on or something to break a factory barrel loose. Uh, so I don't think we need to go anywhere near that tight. Now, when we do our ultimatum uh, deadline build up, I'm going to contact ultimatum before we install the barrel and make sure that uh, we have the correct torque spec for the barrel nut there. So make sure you watch the uh, build series uh, to see what the correct torque spec is for the ultimatum deadline. Uh, but I'm going to guess it's probably going to be in that 30 to 40 foot pounds range. So hopefully that helps you out. Uh, if there's any question and you're utilizing a custom action or an aftermarket barrel nut, make sure you ask the manufacturer what they recommend. And our last question comes from Philip. And Philip asks, 
would like to see if you can get a couple of T&E rifles with switch barrel setups such as Proof Research's Switch and see how in or convenient the switchover with realigning the scope and everything else goes with your schedule. Is it worth the time slash trouble? Uh, well, Philip, I don't have any experience with the Proof Research Switch. Um, there are a couple of uh, switch barrel options that have piqued my interest uh, that work in conjunction with the Remington 700 that I may look into in the future because I really do like the idea of being able to uh, have a match caliber and then have a training caliber and switch between the two. Uh, but there are really two ways to look at the switch barrel system. Um, two groups that I think I separate uh, switch barrel uh, customers into. Uh, the first is the guy that doesn't want to be without his rifle or send his rifle off when he gets to the end of the barrel life. Say he's running again one of these uh, fast six millimeters or one of these barrel burning calibers for matches and when he gets to the end of the barrel life he wants to just be able to break the rifle down, replace the barrel with a brand new barrel, put everything back together, zero the scope and then not mess with it again until the barrel burns out again. Uh, that way you can have a barrel sitting on the shelf, and when you hit the end of that barrel life, which is, you know, Murphy's Law says it's going to be the week before a big match, uh, then you can quickly switch those barrels over and not be down without your rifle for a while. Uh, that is one type of system, and for that, something like a Savage or a Remage or the Deadline build that we're going to do here, uh, that makes sense because really to change the barrel on this rifle, you're going to have to take it out of the chassis. You're going to have to put it in a barrel vise. You're going to have to use tools to remove the barrel. Uh, so it's going to take a little bit of time. Depending upon the chassis system that you're using, it has the possibility of changing your dope setting, which means you'll have to go out and re-zero your scope. You can't just rely on turning the turrets back to zero. Uh, and that's a lot of trouble. It's not a lot of trouble if you're doing it every 2,000, 3,000 rounds, uh, it is a lot of trouble if you're doing it every other week. Uh, so I put that kind of system where you're utilizing a barrel nut and uh, other fastening devices and you have to remove it from the chassis in that category. Now the other category I see is the guy that has a fast match caliber uh, that wants to take his rifle out, he wants to shoot this flat shooting barrel burning caliber and matches, but he wants to go home and he wants to train with a different caliber, say a 223 for his trainer. Uh, if that's the case, uh, then you really want a system that quickly switches over and retains zero between barrels. You don't want to have to remove it from the chassis. You don't want to have to change everything over. Uh, so for that type of system, I think you're going to want to look at something like the bar lock or uh, the switch, or if you're running an Accuracy International, they just have a one uh, screw on the side that you loosen that screw with a uh, Allen wrench, spin your barrel off, back on, and then tighten it down with a torque wrench. And you can keep those tools in your pocket, take them to the range with you, etc. Uh, so, you know, there are really two different sides uh, to look at on this. Uh, I think that if you're running one of these systems that is quickly able to switch the barrel back and forth and you don't have to remove the action, then you're just going to end up a situation where you twist the turrets to a preset uh, setting that you have written down in your data book and you're ready to roll. Those don't seem to be very inconvenient. Um, I have experience with the uh, DTA SRS or the Desert Tech SRS and the Accuracy International ATs, uh, which they return to zero very, very well. So you could do that with those systems. Um, with the uh, other systems that you have to remove from the chassis, that's not going to be a good choice for that. So it's more about applying the correct system to your intended task. And uh, with this system, the build that we're doing, the intent is to run the same barrel until we burn it out and then swap it over. Although at some point, I I may get a 223 barrel for it just to see how easy that process is. Uh, but since we do have to remove the action from the chassis, I'll have to remove the scope rail from the top of the action uh, because we do have an overhang of the barrel nut here. I don't think we'll be able to get the barrel nut wrench on uh, with the scope rail on it. Uh, those kind of things prevent this from really being a quick changeover to a training barrel and then back to a match barrel before match day. Uh, but 
you have to really choose what's going to work well for you. So I hope that puts those in perspective and kind of gives you an example. Hopefully we will get into some of these uh, quick change barrel systems. And I'm really going to kind of divide these between switch barrels and quick change barrel systems. Uh, quick change barrel systems should be something that you can do in the field, that you can do at the bench, at the range, uh, or that you can do, you know, at your table right before you grab your stuff and roll out to the range. Uh, so we'll uh, work some more with some of these quick change barrel systems going forward. Uh, the uh, Barlock system from American Rifle Company is really interesting. I haven't looked in depth into the proof research switch barrel system, uh, but I'll do a little bit more research on that. And if you guys have any questions or comments or uh, experience with the different barrel change systems, please drop in the comments down below. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Well, that was our last question, so now let's go over some of the parts that I have sitting in front of me. We already talked about the deadline action, and again, it's a very attractive action, a really nice uh, modification or a really nice evolution of the original uh, Ultimatum U300 action. Uh, and I'm looking forward to getting it uh, into the rifle. Just working the bolt without a trigger in it, it's very smooth, very nice bolt lift, but we'll see when we get it installed. Uh, we spoke about the Excalibur barrel here. Again, Savage Prefit. It has a 6.5 Creedmoor chamber in it. It is a 1 8, one and 8 twist, uh, 24 inch, and it is threaded for uh, suppressor or muzzle brake here on the end. I haven't decided yet if or what muzzle device we're gonna put on it. Uh, but I, I may, for fun, just run a suppressor on it. Uh, for competition, though, I generally prefer to run a brake. Uh, less problems, less issues with mirage, and less overall length to have to thread through barricades. So uh, we'll see going forward, when we get a little closer to completion, uh, what muzzle device I'm gonna put on this guy. The big deal that we're going to talk about is sitting here in front of me. Uh, this is the Modular Driven Technologies ESS chassis. And uh, again, we are sponsored by Modular Driven Technologies. They did send the ESS chassis out to us. Uh, so keep that in mind. But regardless of who's supporting the show, you're going to get my honest opinion of what the product is. Now, this chassis has been uh, updated specifically for the deadline action, so there are some relief cuts in here that don't appear on the Remington 700 version. One other difference is the magazine release is shorter on the deadline version because that magazine has to ride lower. The size of the action does not allow the uh, magazine to slide up inside as far as Remington's do. Uh, also, the diameter of the bolt and the 60 degree bolt throw requires that magazine to run lower. Uh, so because of that, they have to modify the magazine catch. Um, that allows it to drop in here, so you may have to do those if you have a Remington 700 chassis that you want to run a deadline in. Uh, it was nice of them to send us out the uh, base section that is designed specifically for the Ultimatum, and that is an option on their website now. So if you are going to do a deadline build, uh, you can just select the drop down for the deadline, and this will come to you ready to roll. You won't have to do any modifications. Now, the big deal with this chassis is this guy right here. As you can see, uh, we have the side folding skeleton stock built in here. And this is really cool. We talked about it at SHOT Show. Uh, this is a really exciting setup for me because usually when you have a side folding stock, uh, you end up having a single hinge and you end up having the axis for the hinge or the, the pin for the hinge hanging out to one side or the other. Uh, if you have a right folder like we have set up here, then that means that hinge is going to be in the way when you cycle the bolt. Or if you're a left-handed shooter, it's going to be right in front of your face. If you have a left folding folder, uh, then that hinges on the opposite side and again, right in front of your face. If you have a big heavy recoiling rifle, uh, you may be concerned about rearranging some dental work. A lot of times that's not an issue because they run the hinge far enough forward, but then it can get in the way of your hand. If you like to float your thumb, uh, like they have designed here on the ESS chassis, then that hinge definitely gets in the way. I know on my Accuracy Internationals, it's kind of in the way. A lot of other chassis folding systems that we have, uh, that gets in the way. Uh, so what this does with the double hinge assembly here uh, is when we extend the stock here, now we don't have any hinge at all. 
I can run my thumb same side here. I can run my thumb same side here and no hinge. Uh, so it's a really, really nice setup. Now the trick is because you have two hinges, you have to be really close on those tolerances because any tolerances now are going to be doubled uh, when you run two hinges, but it locks up very, very tightly. Uh, in addition, they made quite a few changes to the skeleton stock, uh, both the improvements over the previous version of the skeleton stock, but also to accommodate closing over your bolt handle. So we no longer have a thumb wheel to adjust the elevation Instead, we have two thumb screws here, and you loosen the thumb screws, raise the elevation to where you want, lock it down. I actually prefer this because it's really quick to get it dialed in. Uh, you can throw some O-rings on here uh, to make sure that you know where your adjustment is if for some reason you need to remove this, or if you're setting this thing up for two different shooters, you can set O-rings to give you one adjustment, or just take a silver Sharpie and draw lines on the post, and you can see where they need to be at. Now, you do have thumb screws here to attach it on one side. They also include brass-tipped set screws that can go on the other side. Uh, so if you want a more permanent lockdown or to take out any chance of these screws backing out and your cheek piece dropping down, you can put those in on that side and lock everything down. Uh, you still have a thumb wheel for your length of pull adjustment, but then you have a thumb screw down here to lock that in. And again, that takes out any of the wiggle that was present uh, in the previous version of the stock. And I really like the design of this overall. I think it removes some weight, removes some complexity, and uh, overall just took up all the complaints that I had over the previous version skeleton stock and improved it. Uh, we also have an M-lock slot here on the bottom. So if you have a bipod that requires a Picatinny rail, uh, you can slap that in there. If you want to run a sling stud, uh, there's some sling stud options out there as well that will fit into the M-lock recess. Uh, we've got QDs here, here, and here. Uh, so if you run a QD sling like I do, uh, then you have plenty of options and those are on both sides. Now to collapse the stock, we just have one button right here, but you do need to make sure you get that button pushed all the way in for both stages of the folding. If you don't, uh, then you may fold one stage and you may have to push the button again to fold the next stage. Uh, but it really is intuitive after you've done it a couple of times and it's no big deal at all. And again, you have a button here uh, to press to open. But we did notice that very often you just pull the stock open and you can overcome that. And there we go. Uh, so really a great design overall. I'm really pleased with how tight this locks up. I can't wait to get some time on it and get some work on it and uh, see uh, if it stays nice and tight over its service life. Uh, now one other thing I wanna point out here is MDT did include one of their brand new pistol grips. Uh, this pistol grip is their own design. It is a little bit more swept back than I generally prefer, although it does have a really nice palm swell on here. And when we come up and I run with my thumb on the same side, that palm swell really locks in to the middle of my hand and it feels very nice. Again, I usually prefer a little bit more vertical grip, but this feels really good. Uh, so when we get it out and actually start shooting with it, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it works out for me overall. The rest of the ESS chassis is uh, pretty much identical to the previous version that we reviewed. Uh, so if you want more details on the ESS chassis, make sure you go check out our review video. Now, one of the really neat added accessories that they sent out uh, with the chassis is their new Arca Swiss rails. Uh, they have several different varieties. We have a 7 inch here and we have a 10 and a half inch here. Uh, the 10 and a half does not play nice with this rail system uh, on the ESS. It really requires the longer rail system. So uh, make sure you order the appropriate uh, Arca Swiss adapter for your intended section. Uh, the 7 inch works very well uh, for the section I have on here. And it is M-Lock compatible, so it just bolts right into the bottom here. And now we can install whatever Arca accessories we want, barricade stops, bipods, uh, whatever, and it gives you a pretty wide latitude on where you mount those. And the really nice thing about the Arca rails is that you can quickly and easily 
set up your fore end of your rifle for whatever the shooting problem is. Now this isn't something that really applies to most field shooters or most casual shooters, uh, but competition shooters have really gravitated towards the ARCA system uh, because you can very quickly add accessories wherever you need them on your fore end and move them around. Uh, most of the ARCA clamps either use thumb wheels or uh, throw levers, so it's really fast to move them. Uh, the plates from MDT, they have screw holes alongside of them, uh, so you can put in screws to act as index points if you wish. So if you need to move your bipod to a certain spot and you want that certain spot all the time, uh, then you can drop those in there. If not, you can leave them out and then you're free to move to wherever you need to move. So really nice design. I like to see that uh, gun companies are grabbing what was a... Uh, a kind of a great idea by one of the shooters that we know and uh, expanding upon that and uh, really taking it and running with it. So uh, nice that MDT has an option now for you. Uh, we also have one of the LSS XL chassis in uh, that we are going to do a separate review on it. And that is where this big guy, this 10 and a half inch rail comes in. Uh, this covers most of the fore end on the LSS XL and really allows you again to put an ARCA adapted uh, device or accessory wherever you want to put it along there. Uh, so I'll be really interested to get that on and use that and see how well that works in the competition environment. Now, one more thing before we go, uh, we did want to talk about a new magazine that we're going to be trying out in this setup. Uh, this is the new MDT Steel 13 round magazine. And what makes this really, really cool is uh, most guys will grab an Accuracy International 10 round magazine and then they will add some kind of adapter or whatever on the bottom to get an extra couple of rounds. Uh, this ends up just being a safety thing as far as or an insurance thing when you're on a stage. Uh, sometimes there are jams, sometimes there are issues where you end up having to kick a round out in the dirt. Uh, a lot of us used to run uh, two round holders on the side so we could grab a spare round at the end of the stage and throw it into the chamber. Well, having a magazine extension and running uh, 12 or 13 rounds in your magazine just kind of negates the need for that, and it'll save you seconds on a stage if there's an issue. So instead of buying really expensive magazines and then putting a expensive extender on the bottom of them, MDT now makes a 13 round magazine. Now, the nifty thing about this is this is their 13 round magazine. This is a 10 round AICS magazine. And they are almost exactly the same length. So you're not sacrificing anything to be able to get 13 rounds in the magazine. The way that they do that is uh, the taper is very smooth on the AI magazine. Uh, the taper is more severe and towards the top on the MDT magazine. So the rounds stay double stacked for longer uh, before they're pushed together into the single stack to feed. Uh, so that's interesting. We'll see uh, how well it will work with 308 and then also with uh, 65 Creedmoor. I may even give it a turn in the 260, uh, but if it feeds the 308, it should feed the 260 just fine. And I don't have uh, cartridge overall length information right now, but we will get that to you uh, when we go into detail on the magazine. Uh, one other nifty thing that they sent out is they did send out their 10 round magazine and the 10 round magazine, the top portion of it is pretty much exactly like the 13 round magazine. So now again, we have a 10 round magazine that is about, uh, about half to three quarters of an inch shorter than the 10 round AI magazine, the AICS magazine. Uh, so again, really interesting to uh, get these out and try them out. Uh, we had some issues when we initially tried the MDT polymer magazines. Uh, the steel magazines, I don't think will suffer from any of the bulging issues that we have with those. Uh, they do have some pretty significant uh, reinforcing and stamping on the side here. Uh, so I am really looking forward to getting them out to the field and working on those. That is the basic overall components for the Ultimatum Deadline build uh, that we will be putting together here in the next week or two. Uh, hopefully we can get started on it next week. Maybe we'll get your first installment, which will be barrel installation out. And uh, we are still waiting on our trigger to arrive. We should be getting a Trigger Tech Diamond Trigger in uh, to install on this thing. But the Diamond Triggers have been back ordered everywhere. Hopefully we'll get it in in time. Uh, if not, then we may just install one of the regular uh, 
Trigger Tech Remington 700 triggers uh, into it. We've got one of those in a different rifle that we've been reviewing here right now. Uh, so we may switch that over and drop that in here until the diamond can arrive. But I'm really interested in that diamond trigger. The Trigger Tech triggers overall have been a very, very nice piece. Uh, they have great feel to them. Uh, so I'll be interested in seeing uh, how much of an improvement the diamond is on what they currently do. And lastly, we haven't decided what optics we're going to put on this guy. Uh, if any of you guys have contacts at Tangent Theta, uh, please let us know because I would love to put a Canadian scope on this almost all Canadian rifle that we're building up here. Uh, that I think would be really, really cool. Plus, I don't have a lot of experience with the Tangent Theta products, uh, but... I just thought that would be awesome. We do have quite a few Canadian viewers. Uh, obviously, Modular Driven Technologies is a Canadian company, so I just thought it'd be really cool to build as much of a Canadian rifle as we can actually build, uh, just to give it a shot. Uh, we are gonna run the Excalibur barrel right now. I realize that is not a Canadian barrel, but you guys asked me about the Excalibur barrel. We are actually working on getting a Canadian barrel in for this setup. Uh, so that is the current state of affairs. If you guys have any questions or comments over anything that we've covered here or any of the questions that we answered, please leave them in the comments section below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you guys are listening to us on your favorite podcast app, you can send questions to us at 8541tactical at gmail.com. If you like the episode, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And I want to send a special shout out to you guys that are supporting us on Patreon. We are really, really, really thankful for our Patreon uh, subscribers and you guys are helping us out greatly. If you guys want to know more about Patreon and how you can help support the content that you know and love, please click the link down below and it'll take you to our Patreon page. Uh, we hope to do a little bit more on Patreon. I'm going to try to work on doing some uh, private uh, conference call type things. That way you guys can ask me questions in real time and I can respond to them. And we're going to do that for our Patreon subscribers very soon. Uh, so make sure you get on board and check that out. And until next time, get out and shoot.